slowly but surely I think we should continue. I hope you all refreshed and as excited as I am for the next talk by uh, Sabine Meinberger, who also contributed to the catalog of the exhibition. Sabine Meinberger is professor for comparative literature at the University of Bonn. Her research fields are art, aesthetics, and anthropology, and in recent years, she published books and essays on concepts and functions of lines in Western culture. For example, she also co-edited uh, a volume on this particular issue in philosophy, mathematics, cartography, anthropology, and art theory. It's called um, Linienwissen und Liniendenken, which would be translated vaguely into line knowledge and line thinking, and is an encyclopedic and collaborative book with contributions by many scholars. It's really worthwhile. Uh, reading if you have a lot of time. <laughs> um, and um, amongst many others also, they just discuss Gegu in this book. Um, her last monography is, focuses on lines, gestures, and books in the work of the Francophone writer and artist Henri Michaud. And with her lecture, Dancing Architecture, she will discuss Gego's collaboration with the dancer and choreographer, Sonia Senoha, and in particular, the performance, Guerdas Simple Medida. And just a short information, right after the talk of Sabine, we will have the chance to see the restage of the performance in the exhibition space, um, which we uh, produced together with the Fundación Sonia Senoha Alfredo Silva Estrada and the John Krenko School here in Stuttgart. And it will start around 3.30. Uh, we try to be punctual, of course. And for those who are watching online, you'll be seeing a film of the performance um, digitally. So enjoy. So. Thank you very much for the invitation to this conference. Thank you for the nice words, uh, Stephanie uh, Reisinger. I'm very pleased and happy to contribute to this meeting of colleagues who are all specialists in this field, much more specialists than I am. Perhaps we can start with my book. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Some years ago, in the district of Berlin, where I live, a new park has been opened. First, a huge amount of new buildings has been constructed, blocks of I don't know how many hundreds of flats, and then the new park in front of them has been laid out. It is in an area, uh, it's an area that for decades had been disused, as it had been part of the border strip between East and West Berlin. There are many tracks, the train, trains pass through, but for a long time, traffic had been extremely reduced and partly completely interrupted by the border. Some tiny brick signalman's houses, now ruins, are still there. All over the tracks, the grass grew untouched. An ecological world of its own had emerged with plants, birds, and insects nobody would expect in the middle of a big city. Even foxes lived there. Now, some tiny spots of the wilderness have been preserved. They are carefully protected by signs, do not enter track wilderness, all the rest is gone. The park consists of a large, even surface, mostly straight path, broad enough for cars, all made of concrete or asphalt. Good for skating and biking, but too hard for elderly jogging knees. And people may sit down and enjoy the sun on some wooden steps, not benches. Everything is made in a way that requires as little human labor as possible to maintain it. In contrast to another park nearby, I have never seen someone working on this new recreation area. As the trees are still small, and especially in this season when they don't have leaves yet, from everywhere in the park, one sees the new housing complexes and the trains on the new railway tracks. But what is most impressive is that wherever the eyes wander, they see grids and parabars, 
and parallel bars and grids and grids and grids and parallel bars and grids and parallel bars. There are fences and barriers, and obviously a fence of only parallel bars is not easy to climb over. So jogging in this area on the sparse grass alongside the asphalted path, I always ask myself, how can one create something so boring? Isn't there anyone among the experts for cityscapes who knows how fascinating grids and parallel bars could be in urban space? Has nobody ever seen an example of Gego's work? She showed us so convincingly that grids can be set in motion, that they can wave and respire or swing in the air, and that grids are not only good for enclosing us and keeping us out of somewhere, but for the opposite as well, for opening and letting something through. Looking at her works in the exhibition rooms here, I see grids that often recall wire mesh fans, but they are twisted and turned and they have holes. Hmm? Doesn't work. Okay, so, very often, where normally is a knot, where strings of wire meet or metal bars are joined and connected, just at this crucial point, there is a small empty space in Gigos grids. The paper ground shines through it. It is bright, it sparkles, it looks like a small glimmering star. No? Yes. As if she had given a visual comment on the contemporary urban world made of rigid geometric forms, which are not only functional, but also a style, Gego also made grids and parallel lines everywhere, but in a very different way. Her grids and parallel bars structure surface and space, sometimes for public space, as well. And at the same time, they indicate ways out. They seem ironic statements on the endless contemporary multiplications of the same form, on the identical industrial reputation of patterns. She seems to quote them and to turn them away from their usual appearance, transforming them into, yeah, what shall we say? I would say a promise of happiness. Such breathing grids we see also on a book cover. The grid opens as if someone had it cut off. It looks like a piece of textile. We see the regular structure every thread and point, and in the opening between the two pieces, something unexpected emerges. Letters, words, a name, a title. It is the cover of a book with poetry written by the Venezuelan poet Alfredo Silva Estrada and published in 1979. The title is, as you see here, Variaciones sobre reticularias, en homenaje a Gigo. It refers to Gegu's most famous work, Reticularia. We know a special installation that he first realized in 1969. We have already seen it, but I read it. The book remembers its 10th anniversary. It is an artist's book, or in other words, poetic texts, typography, drawings, format, colors, paper, haptic qualities. Nothing is indifferent here. All factors work together. The whole book object, the whole book object has been carefully designed by Gigo's partner Gerd, Lo Gerd Leufert. The text is a multi-part poem. More precisely, it is made of two sequences of seven poems each. The first poem in both groups of text is titled Reticularias. The others may be considered variations, although they are individual poems in various poems as well, not, and not depending from the first one. This book is not in the exhibition here, and for this reason, I am opening and folding it for you now. So, title cover, you have already seen. Now I'm going forward. That's it. I'm commenting on the 
you could see, can see how drawings and texts are combined and how Silva Estrada pays his respect to the creator of the visual forms used in the book. This drawing of 1975 is of special interest. It is used twice in the book, first in red and then in black. Its appearance is a good example for the attention on details, because not only the color is changed, but also the position. As far as I can see, the drawing on the uh, black version, the drawing has been turned and mirrored. Now the pages with the two poems beginning with the word reticularias. With both texts stand next to Gago's drawing. And together with this graphic work, on a double page spread, they form a pair. The double page with the red drawing introduces the volume of poetry like a kind of epigraph. Usually an epigraph is a line, a sentence, often a quotation from another author. In any case, it is something verbal. Here, it embraces writing and drawing. Words and visual form combining two different arts and media. Now I will show you the poem from the double page with the black drawing. So here you see it in Spanish and English. It is Reticularius number two. So I am quoting only the English version. Reticular areas, nothing but ties, knots and ties, ropes, simple measurement, freedom of the hand in its thinking touch and with gaze downcast into tiny abysses. The title of Gego's magnum opus serves as the title of the poem. As if the poetic text and the designed book could also be, could also be included in the group of works called Reticularias. The drawing printed on paper is, of course, just the wire form in a different state, and vice versa. Gego's constructions of wire are drawings in a different state, drawings in three dimensions. The loosely coupled words of the poem with their repetitions seem to continue the mesh, mesh structure of Gego's drawings and objects in a verbal medium. And why not? After all, texture and text differ only by three letters. The poem is less about wires and pieces of metal than about flexible textile connections. Ropes rather than ruts, knots instead of hooks. The one and the other link in a simple way. And here finally, the Venezuelan dancer Sonia Sanoja, the dear friend of Gregos, comes into play. For she refers to Gregos' art with a very special dance performance using ropes. We are happy to be able to see a version of it here in Stuttgart and immediately after this, after my talk. Tacto pensante, tactile thinking, the hand with a thinking touch, can certainly be attributed to both women artists. With her pliers, Gigo forms ethereal shapes and draws without paper, with metal rods that cast linear shadows on the walls and on the ground. Zenoya, on the other hand, constructs kinetically and kinesthetically with her own body. The activity of building is what they have in common. Danza is construir. Es construir, dancing is building, Senora wrote in her book on dance in 1971. But dancing is a form of building carried out with ephemeral materials and temporary forms. Coming back to the book, we come back to Silva Estrada's book and the quoted poem, and we may say the poet refers to Gigo's visual and sculptural work and to Senora's dancing with ropes. An art, the art of the book, combines them. Thus, various arts form an inter-artistic meshwork. The lines of the poem recall Gego's grids. As in the empty space between the crossing lines of her net structures, abysses open up to the penetrating gaze in the empty space between words. These abysses may be minimal in their measurable width, but they are enormous in terms of the effort required to engage mentally with a probing hand. And we wonder how haptic can thinking become? 
I'm still talking about this book while you expect me to talk about dance. But there's a reason for this delay. The poem with the title Reticularius is not only a text readers could find on these pages. It appears also in the dance performance by Sonia Senocha. She danced, her husband, Silvastrada, her husband, the poet, wrote. His text was part of her dance performance. Both artists responded to Gego's work in their own idiom. In the stage, you will see the poem projected on the ball, readable behind the dancer. Originally, it was also to be heard. The whole performance was a cooperation of artist friends. We imagine something like that, the most promising kind of teamwork. Gego was, as we know, a versatile artist. She worked in many materials and techniques, formats and genres, in two and three dimensions, with graphic means and paper and with wire, steel, acrylic, iron, wood. This kind of multiple activity implies not only cooperation with, colleague, with colleagues, as in the case of her printed work, or the huge installation in the public space. So I'm just finishing this, uh, what I wanted to say here. We talked already about this um, connection between the different arts, and even in this case, we have poetry, dance, book design, music, and architecture, and they all meet in this case. Before talking about Sonia Senocha's dance, let me still say something about Gego's relation to books. As already mentioned, the publication Variaciones is not in the exhibition. But there are three examples demonstrating Gego's interest in this field. In the book as something between the usual technical tool for reading, so bound sheets with printed texts on them, and the usual product of visual arts, a flat surface with colors on it, or a more or less bulky thing. The first example, yes. The first example dates to 1963. It's a long foldout made of several sheets of cardboard without any text, but with printed lines more precisely imprinted or impressed lines. It's called intaglio print without ink. And we can even distinguish different kinds of layout on the page. There are the usual horizontal lines running from left to right using the whole width um, of the page. But there's also printing in columns. And the two columns, that's the second uh, page here, you can better see then uh, in the exhibition. And the, the columns are slightly inclined. The foldout has been put into a black closable portfolio. Striking here the title, the object is called Poesia. Though this choice implies an interesting statement, say, poetry is made of lines on paper, but the lines need not be written, they may also be printed, and print needn't be something black on white. It may also be pressed into the paper, a relief of the sheet generating different shades of white. This poetry does not need letters and words. It does not appeal to our reading skills, but only to our optical and haptic perception, and even more. Folding and unfolding the sheets is a kinetic and kinesthetic experience as well. The second example, so it's from 1966, is again a foldout. But the technique is lithograph on paper. It's called Lithographia plegada. And the portfolio is a solid box with fabric covers. In this case, again, we see lines. Not only these broad yellow stripes, but also fine, bright yellow lines. Yeah, you can see it better um, outside than the original. And the last example, Lithograph on paper as well is a book with pages bound normally to open to turn, but with an extreme horizontal format. It recalls more a book for collecting landscape sketches than one to read. The pages are again covered, covered by lines, what you can see here, traced lines, not rectified by typography, but by typographical means. They vary as lines in wood or small waves on a water surface. But here on the right page, we have three written lines as well. Very few words with repetitions, parallel constructions, and a witty ending. I smile, they glide, 
I laugh, they bounce, leap comes with nonsense. They are taken from a poem by Amy Baker, and they are a poem from Thals, and a poetological statement as well. They confirm the playful nature of artistic activity and the unpredictability of its working processes. Nonsense, we are told, is a source of productivity. The close affinity between drawing and poetry is again claimed as the book title is Lenius. Considering these works, the book by Silva Estrada, so this book is very close to Gego's book art. And it is no wonder when we think of the personal relations between the artists participating in its genesis. Actually, one should have put all the four names on the cover. Now, let us come back to Sano Hastans, which is somehow introduced by the poem and performed under its sign, so to say. Her performance was created in 1977. Originally, it was part of the first retrospective of Gego's work that took place at the Museo de Arte Contemporánea in Carreras. Gego then was 60 years old, Sonia Sanora 20 years younger. She also had made a name of herself internationally. Sanora was a leading exponent, exponent of avant-garde dance in Venezuela and famous for an art of movement, movement that claims its own place in the field of contemporary experimental dance. In a certain way, Gegos and her artistic activity seem to be made for each other. The one makes architectural form move, the other considers dancing a kind of constructing. Both of them feel no gap between the art of durable things in space par excellence and the fluid forms of a human body in motion. Sonia, Sonia Senora inserts herself in Gego's spaces, as we can see on the invitation to the performance. It was called Choreo Gegos, a portmanteau word made of choreographia and the name of the artist friend. Both parts of the word have five letters. In terms of, in terms of quantity, they are exactly equivalent. There is no illustration of Gigo's art by dance, but a combination of two equal arts and artists, the letter she belonging to both parts of it. The title, Reticularias, is also a portmanteau word. We heard it in another talk today. So the dancer's wordplay word play res rep responds to the visual artist's ones. The play, they play a game of reciprocal gestures. Senora was dancing to music by Alfredo del Monaco, a pioneer of contemporary music in Venezuela. The piece that has been composed for her is, for her is known and used in later performances as Tres Atmosferas Choreográficas para Sonia Senora. Since 1978, the dance performance has been titled Guardas Simple Medida Choreogigo. And you remember these words quote two lines from the poem by Silva Estrada. The poetic text was either played back in a recording of the author's voice or projected for reading at the beginning. But there is still another connection to a work by Gego. The keyword cuerdas, ropes, which describes the characteristic prop of the dance performance, also recalls the eponymous installation by Gego in the interior courtyard of the Museo, Museo de Arte Contemporaneo. Nylon ropes are ten tensioned ray-like to, to form planes. So I remember it only. It is one of the few works by Gego commissioned for a public space that still exists today, but I don't need uh, to say much. Uh, about it for Monica Amo has already analyzed this non-sculpture in a very in a fascinating way, though we know everything about it. In the exhibition, visitors do not only see some photographs of the building and the wide span object, but you know, also a small scale model, model that can be seen from close. This is an advantage because uh, thus the material affinity between the nylon ropes of this huge outdoor work and the ropes Sanora plays with while dancing becomes really evident. Sanora performed her piece herself in 1977, 78 and 81 
And in 1979, a video recording was made with her. In 1998, and in the restagings in 2010, 2012, and 2016 and 17, others danced. The performance of 2010 was part of the event Visionarios by Unearte in Caracas, which was dedicated to pioneers of modern dance choreography in Venezuela. Senoja developed in together with the dancer Claudia Capriles, who realized the restage of the dancers here in Stuttgart. It was a dancer of the Krenko School. A recording of the performance in 2010 is available online from the Fondación Sonia Zanoja, Alfredo Silva Estrada, and is also to be seen here in the exhibition when there is no live performance. So now, finally, let us take a closer look on Sanoja's dance performances. In 1977, during the retrospective, she danced with Gego's objects, between them and around them. For example, she stands in front of a grid on the wall, places a form of tangled strips in front of her face so that it appears to replace her head. Or she crouches, sits or kneels between the spheres of wire distributed in the room. One sees her through the transparent volumes interacting with them. Sometimes she appears to be imitating their position so we can see here, she's responding to the form of the objects with her pose. She casts her shadow on the wall, so producing a two-dimensional double, which as a black plane supplements the delicate spatial volume of lines and the shadows. Perhaps it is no coincidence that precisely these photographs exist. Photography thus inevitably recalls the age-old history of the visual arts. You all know the myth of painting and sculpture, having originated with traced shadows, has been made reality by photographs, so literally tracing or engraving light. The photographs of Sanora supplement the old legend with the idea of an inner relationship to movement. The more mobile the body, the more diverse the silhouettes. And the greater the chance of going beyond representation of the human form, this inherent narcissism of Western art. As shadows, the dancers' poses become allusions to the human being, not images of the human being. Allusions to it amid abstract organic forms. Living bodies never stand still. Dancing makes that clear. It is not really a special activity at all, as, uh, as it is sometimes claimed. But dance merely reinforces the normal state. Because we cannot not move. We are doing it constantly. We are movement. Life is constitution constitutionally motoric. But movement always takes place within a space and by no means in one defined by three dimensions, existing independently of us. Rather, movement creates a space around itself, unfolds structures, occupies it. And this space is temporal. It results from and with movement. It shifts, opens up, and pulls together. It is elastic. An art of movement makes it possible to perceive this condition of life, placing before our eyes what living bodies constantly perform. Experts in the kinetic and kinesthetic know this very well. Senora herself speaks of mobile horizons. Dancing demonstrates the prerequisite, prerequisite of life all the more emphatically, the less an identifiable type of dance is in play. When it is not something being danced, so she is dancing the samba, but rather dancing, dancing in the sense of the intransitive verb, she is dancing, thus being the modern equivalent to a verb in the middle voice that old languages had. To paraphrase the, the linguist Emile Bonveniste, with this type of verb, the subject is at the center of a process and is at the same time its actor. It does something that is performed on it, it can be borne by the movement that it initiates. 
but it directs neither the course nor the goal and does not aim for anything. The action set in motion is sufficient unto itself. I think Gego's works can best be described in this spirit. They are not so much things in a space as potentiators of interaction with the environment. These include both human actors and non-human actors, people as well as materials, space, light, atmosphere. Her wire constructions tremble when the breeze passes through them. They participate in their surroundings and vice versa, each penetrating the other. The objects have no inside and outside. They are not solids in the Euclidean sense. Many vibrate at the slightest touch. Several recall mobiles. Viewers do not stand opposite, th opposite them, but find themselves between and inside them. The dancer also makes herself part of them when she engages with them. For physically touching, the object is not, is no, not sacrilege. Rather, it reinforces their relational nature and immanent dynamic. In her performances in 1977, Sonora touched Gego's objects. apparently holding them tight, climbing over parts of them, embracing them with arms and legs, or seemingly imitating them, for example, by stretching upward while standing next to an upright slender phone. She has described her relationship with them with the metaphor of everyday interaction with things. As she says, she wants to dance between these sculptures, allow herself to be enveloped and that is a need as elemental as drinking. Taking the morphology of Gego's wire structures literally, she wants to wrap herself in this textile as if in, a black, as if in a blanket. She wants to wear it. And that is exactly what she finally achieves with her costume for Guerda's Simple Medida Correo Gego. You can see it here in the Kunst Museum next to the stage for the performance the black leotard with her robes handmade by Senora. She has been dancing with it and the long rope here laid out on the floor since 1978. In the performances, since then, no objects are on stage with her for the dancer to play around. They are rather objects on her body, having themselves become part of it. Or better, out of the dancing movements emerges something sculptural and at the same time fluid. The thick ropes that are attached to her sleeves like oversized fringes and the long rope that the performer ties to both ankles make that possible. The ropes hanging down from her arms move like enormously wide sleeves or a heavy poncho. They follow every move of her extremities and of her upper body vibrating Follow it, following it down, wrapping around it, being held like a bundle. The dancer's movements are slow. The thick ropes do not permit any rapidly changing poses. They would hinder any functional action, like an extremely impractical item of clothing, allowing only expansive, extended gestures. All of that gives the piece a hieratic character. It begins with a ritual looking pose. That's a photograph from the restage here in Stuttgart. The performer is sitting on her heels with her hands on her knees. The ropes flow down from her arms like drapery folds. A single rope lies before her, spread out in a more or, le more or less circular form. When she then moves, she interacts with the ropes as if with familiar beings. They cling to her body and slide over it. When handling the six meter long rope, her gestures are very measured. Her dark suit and the light colored ropes make a strong contrast. Time and again, the human body disappears under them. And in return, the ropes seem to produce changing figures on their own. Their emergence and disappearance seem almost magical. But it is presumably less about the phantasma. The dancer is referring rather to Gego's invisible works as models of a relationship of bodies, movement, space, and light. Her building by dancing produces structures that are visual, 
haptic and kinetic. They change continuously, form variations, but without an identifiable origin. Dance and object coincide, or to put it another way, dance and visual work are no longer different arts here. Instead, movement creates a plastic object, but it has no fixed place and no solid form. Nevertheless, it is something other than an aspect of the dance, namely something material, palpable, that extends the dancer's body out into its surroundings without entirely obeying it. Following Abi Warburg, the swinging rope's leaves could be called accessories in motion, bewegtes Beiwerk. If only they were more delicate and underscored the movements of the dancer, like waving hair or the tail of a garment. The same function is performed by the lively trains of the young women running quickly past an antiquity and the Renaissance from which the art historian Abi Warburg derived his concept. Nymphs and menads, genuine dancers, distinguish themselves by the fabrics fluttering around their bodies and their rippling hair. Serpentine forms surround them. And they do not just give the impression of physical movement, they also po point to psychological excitation. The accessories, accessories in motion make emotions visible. Here, it is quite different and even complementary. The dancer recedes behind her accessories. The moving robes are the ergon, not the par ergon. They are the work, not the accessories. Again, a picture from the stage here. These tales do not emphasize the human figure as dynamic and dynamizing, but tend to cause to it to dissolve. With the disappearance of the dancer, any possibility of psychological associations vanishes. The formations of robes and body have nothing to do with the depiction of emotions. For that, one would need a person and a face. But here viewers are deprived of both. They do not perceive any feelings, but instead a highly intense sensuality. We believe we are physically sensing the clingy stubborn robes. Something of this order of experience is presumably what is meant by tacto pensante, the thinking touch, the words in the poem. It might also shed light on Senora's view of dancing. For her, I'm quoting, to dance means to build, to create something solid from which we can contemplate and explore the infinite. That was from A Traves de la Danza from 1971. The performance Guarda Simple Medida Choreo Gego brings together dance, music, poetry, and sculpture. Beyond the event itself, it is also tied to the arts of the book, photography, and video, and in the background always, always stands architecture. The attempt to unite the arts under its roof, the roof of architecture, is not just a character, characteristic feature of the famous German Bauhaus. It had prominent representatives in Venezuela as well, such as Carlos Raúl Villanueva, who designed the Ciudad Universitaria de Caracas from the 1940s to the 1960s. Gigo, Senora, and all the others who collaborated on the multimedia and interartistic Guarda Simple Medida Correa Gigo continued such strivings for synthesis. The role of textiles in that is remarkable. For the 19th century German architect and theorist Gottfried Semper, you heard of him, the production of textiles was the source from which architecture had once emerged. He saw it as the very technology that generated the arts. When Gego resorted to meshwork and articulation, she was reflecting, so to speak, on the oldest and most productive technologies of her metier, and perhaps of the arts in general. The avant-garde artist of motion continued that idea. Her piece demonstrates that dancing can also be textile constructing. Sonia Sanuchas Cuerda Semple Medida Cuario Gego is not just an homage to her colleague, but also choreography a la Gertrude Goldschmidt. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>